So, um, bonjour. <laughs> I put this slide in a lot of my decks and I kind of just look at it and do this. That like really relaxes me and then I hear you laugh and then I feel like everything's going well. Um, so I'm Miles. Uh, I work at Google as a developer advocate. I'm focused mostly on the Node.js ecosystem as well as GCP. Um, it's worth mentioning that the opinions expressed in this talk are solely my own. Um, and we'll start with chapter one of the adventure to top level await. Asynchronicity is hard. Two things at the same time. Not easy. <laughs> and the reason why we have asynchronicity in JavaScript is because we don't want to stop the thread. We don't want compute happening in JavaScript to stop scrolling from working, or one user connecting to a server uh, stopping another user from connecting. Everything needs to happen asynchronously. And since the dawn of time, we've had callbacks in JavaScript as a way to handle this. And you may recognize something like this, um, the callback hell, as they call it. And it gets the job done. It's good if you want you know, B to happen after A with the thing that A returned. Um, but the mental model for this is hard. And starting to do things in parallel is hard. Um, and bringing someone new to your code base and explaining why you have such, such depth isn't great. And from a, lear a learning experience and an education perspective, this is really, really bad user experience for the language. And so we started to think about new patterns. Uh, promises as a pattern have, pr have existed longer than JavaScript itself. Um, and there's been lots of different implementations in JavaScript. There were early promise implementations in Node that got ripped out as they were considered controversial. Bluebird is an example of an implementation of promises that existed in userland. It wasn't until around 2014 that they actually landed in ES5 and were specified in the language itself. Um, and you can convert that code that we had before to something that looks like this, which you know, is a little better. Um, especially when we're thinking about handling both um, things we want to happen synchronously and asynchronously. From a control flow perspective, it's a bit better. We have that catch at the end, so any errors that happen, we can just kind of grab them at once. But there's a still a lot of cognitive overload here. We're still dealing with callbacks because we still have to give a callback to the then. We now have to understand how promises work. We have to understand how to properly return promises so we can chain them. And so if you want to get someone up and running with asynchronicity in JavaScript, there's a whole slew of different concepts that they need to grasp before they can even start to understand how to tackle the beast that is async. In December of 2016, one of what I think is one of the best features to land in the language in a long time came, which is async await. And we can refactor one more time to something that looks like this. Um, and you know, it's still not perfect, but things are happening one line after another. We can await A, and then await B, await C, and then await D, and know that it's going to happen in that order. We don't need to learn about promises or about callbacks just to do something. So when we're talking about kind of an entry into a library that you're building, or what the readme will look like, it's much more intuitive and easier for people to get an idea of what's going on. It's easier to jump into a, call, into a stack that you don't know and look at the code and reason about what's happening in the order that it's happening in. That brings us in to kind of where we're at right now, which is to not tell me what I can't do. I don't want to be told where to call a wait. So in February of 2017, Node 7.6 was released and it included V8 5.5, which was the version that supports async await. And I was extremely excited to use it until I got this error. Has anyone seen this error before? <laughs> Yeah, um, this is when I learned that you needed to put await inside of an async function. And I, I, will, I will say that this is a great error. Like as far as errors go to tell you what you need to do, this is pretty clear. <laughs> put your await in an async function. Um, but all of a sudden, a lot of the things that I wanted to use await for just are not possible. And, you know, that's really <laughs> how I felt about it. Um, and it looked like the idea of top level await just wasn't a thing at all. Um, and so around May, I tried my first attempt to make top-level await work in Node. Um, I have this saying that uh, people work to the abstraction boundary that they have control over. 
Um, so, you know, I can push patches to node, so that's where I think to fix this problem. Um, and it may be hard to read in this patch, but um, what you're going to see there is we have a native module.wrapper. So every time you require a module in node, um, we're actually doing a really fancy string concatenation. We're taking all the code that you had, and we're just putting an immediately invoked function expression around it. And that's where we inject in things like require and exports and dir name and file name. That's how they all show up. If you ever want to really mess up Node, you can actually just close and open uh, some braces. And please don't do that. You'll blow everything up. Um, but I tried to just turn that into an async function. <laughs> what could go wrong? Um, everything. <laughs> It turns out that Node is expecting a whole bunch of things from timing and execution order. And if every single module that gets required in Node is now returning a promise to resolve instead of actually resolving, and the execution order is not happening as we expect it, it breaks everything in Node. It just straight up broke require. Um, so you know, that's something that we couldn't do. Um, and what I, what I had to find out, though, as well, is it wasn't only Node, it wasn't only the test suite in Node that had a problem with top level await. Because it turns out some people think that top level await is a foot gun. Has anyone heard that expression before? Top level await is a foot gun? I've heard it a lot because in September of 2016, Rich Harris wrote a gist called top level await is a foot gun. Rich Harris is an extremely brilliant programmer who works for the New York Times. And he put down a lot of his thoughts that he had about why top level await was going to be problematic. And any time I mentioned top level await to anyone, this just was brought up. Um, the TLDR of that gist, um, top level await can block execution. Fetching resources over the network could potentially be blocked. That there'd be no interop with common JS, which you know, was something I, I felt firsthand. Um, that cycles could introduce deadlock. And it also has the potential to introduce indeterminism into the graph execution. These seem like a lot of good reasons to not do the thing, um, but I'm not easily swayed. And despite this strong critique, there was actually no direct uh, advice from the committee, TC39, about whether or not top level await should happen or not. So I decided to take top level await to the committee with the worst case scenario being that I would get a solid no, and that could just stop all the online flame wars of people arguing whether or not it should happen. Which brings us to chapter four. A bit of a history lesson building up to this. So top level await was actually always considered while async await was being standardized. Um, in particular, I was able to do some research using the TC39 agendas. So if you go to that link, it has markdown files for all the agendas to all the meetings. And you can do some fuzzy searches through them to kind of, you know, if you're looking about a certain feature or certain things and what discussions had happened. And these are the things that I dug up and figured out. Um, first, async await was originally mentioned at the committees as early as January 2014. Um, and in April of 2014, the await keyword was reserved in the module goal. The module goal is code that gets executed when you import or when you use a script tag that has type module. You can't use the keyword await. So this was like an exact, this was held specifically so that top level await could eventually be a thing. Um, in July of 2015, async await moved to stage two in the process. But it did so only by, by deciding to delay a decision about top level await. No one could reach consensus on it. Um, and at TC39, you need complete consensus of everyone in the room for a feature to move forward in staging. But so let's take a step back and talk about a few of the things that I, that I just mentioned um, and how exactly a language babby is formed. Um, the spec, ECMA 262, that's the specification of the JavaScript language. The committee who implements the spec is TC39, and they do this through ECMA International. They do it via consensus. Everyone in the room needs to agree for something to move forward with no objectors. And the stages that they go through are stage zero, which is a straw man. That means, hey, this is an idea that I have, um, but we don't have any consensus on the idea itself. Um, stage one is a proposal. That means that the committee has agreed that the problem space is worth exploring. We don't necessarily know what the solution to this problem is, but it's something we want to explore. So for top level await to get accepted at stage one, it would need to mean that the committee thinks it's something that could actually happen. Stage two is a draft. That's the point where you have an idea of what the solution to the problem looks like. You have to have some draft spec text and have agreement that that solution is starting to look like how it will actually be implemented. 
Stage three as a candidate means that the spec text is finalized. It's been reviewed by two, two other committee members and reviewed by the editor of the spec as well. At that point at stage three, the feature is ready to start being implemented by, by environments such as V8. At stage four, that means it's finished. It needs to ship in at least two different uh, browsers, and it also needs to have test 262 tests, and there's a whole bunch of other release gates, but by the time a feature is stage four, it's officially part of the language. And through each one of these stages, you need to take it to the committee, and not a single person can disagree with it graduating. So you can imagine that this is kind of hard to do for things that are a little controversial. Which brings us to chapter five, which was getting a foot gun in the door. Um, so in January of 2019, we took top level away to TC39, attempting for stage one. Uh, the proposal included a history of top level await, similar to what we just went over, motivations for the feature, potential implementations for the feature, uh, various use cases, as well as constraints. What are things that would actually stop it from working? So one of the things you don't necessarily think about, when you go to these committees, you need to be prepared with all the reasons people are going to tell you it can't work and have answers for them. So the first motiva motivation that we had were what we're calling immediately invoked async function expressions. You may have noticed that in our last code where we had an async function that was then being immediately invoked, this is a pattern that you're starting to see all over the place in Node. If one of the reasons that people don't want top level await is because it messes with the execution order of the graph, this already does it, and it does it in a way that's inconsistent across the whole graph. If every single module in your graph has one of these immediately invoked async function expressions, we have no idea about the execution order of all these different modules in the graph. This is a problem. A second motivation was completely async modules. So this is a pattern I'm hoping not to see too much, but in this pattern you export an async function and then dynamically import the defaults of another module that's been exported. At this point, we've lost all of the guarantees of ESM. We no longer have any sort of static representation of the graph. So we offered some solutions, some ways to actually make top-level await work. So there was variant A, which is that a call to top-level await would block execution of the graph until it resolved. Um, and so if you had code that looked like this, where you import A and then B and then C, and we assume that all of those modules are calling top-level await, is equivalent of this, an immediately invoked function expression where you await A, and then await B, and then await C. You wait for A to finish executing before you start executing B. Um, and if we were to think about a graph where we have a root node, and then an A, and then a B, and then a C, and then a D, the way in which ESM executes code is what's known in post-traversal order. So the first module that executes is C, and then D, and then A, and then B. And then finally, your root node. So in the case of top-level await variant A, if any of these modules had a top-level await in it, it would execute the first module and then it would stop. Now one of the things that's interesting about this is it's not the same as blocking the thread, which is something we never want to do. It's blocking the execution of the graph. So if let's say A in this graph is the only module that has top-level await, C and D are going to execute, and anything that they put into the microtask queue or into the event loop will continue doing their thing. They're not being blocked by A waiting to resolve. Variant B is a bit of a different uh, take on it, where a call to top level await will block execution of child nodes in the graph, but would allow siblings to continue to execute. So assuming we have A, B, and C the way we did before, the difference here is the equivalent of it being a promise.all on all of the children of the module. So if we go back to that other graph that we were looking at before, let's say that in this graph, C has a top level await. Um, let's see if this will work. Yeah, so C. <laughs> um, when C hits a top level await, it will defer, and D will execute. And when D is done executing, A will not execute because it's waiting for C, but because B is not blocked by it, B will execute. And then at the point that C finishes, A will finish and export its symbols, and then the root will execute. This is a bit of a different approach to it. It's way better for component libraries where we may have a whole breadth of really shallow modules for components. And if you're like fetching resources over the network for lazy loading, you don't want, you know, a hundred modules executing one at a time, especially if they're not related. But this does potentially ruin the expectation of execution order in the graph. Another thing that we talked about was an optional constraint of enforcing the top level away could only be used inside of a module without exports. This would mean that you could only use top-level await if you didn't export any symbols. And this would be a way to stop any sort of cycles or stop it from leaking through the graph. 
Um, and some of the use cases that we talked about were things like dynamic dependency pathing, uh, resource initialization, uh, dependency fallbacks, and polyfilling. Um, but there are constraints. Variant A would halt progress in the graph until resolved. And variant B would halt progress but not block siblings. And that optional constraint would help limit those. Um, but there are existing ways to halt progress in JavaScript, such as infinite loops, infinite recursion, and atomics.wait, which is an API that most of us probably haven't touched. Um, but that raises the question, is blocking execution itself a strong enough reason to block top-level await as a proposal? I don't know. We need to get people to agree to it. Um, another constraint that we talked about was deadlock. So what do you do when two modules import each other? We have to figure that out, too. Um, but we did manage to get consensus that, hey, this is a problem space we want to explore, and top-level await uh, uh, oh, went to stage one. Which brings us into chapter six, which is the road to stage two. Reaching st stage one was a big step because it signaled that the committee was interested in exploring the problem space. But requiring to stage two required a lot more consensus, as well as a general uh, shape of the solution to the problem. So we first identified the necessary spec changes. Um, when your ESM code is executed, it's represented by a graph of source text module records. Um, that's a description of source text module records. We can get to that later. You can check out my slides later. Um, but essentially, the spec defines how these records are instantiated and how they're represented in memory. Um, and we just made all the modules in the graph async. We did this by giving each of the um, abstracted code from async function specification to the instantiation of module records in the graph. And with the structure, every, pro every module would now have a promise capability. It would be thenable, allowing for deferred execution of the top level of a module. So we were able to defer execution by calling spec level await on the execution of modules that, re that return promises. This is all stuff under the hood, but there's actually an await inside of the spec, because the spec itself is its own language. So there's kind of this interesting recursion that await implemented in the spec is used to implement top level await in the language. So this algorithm that we're discussing supports variant A, and by implementing promise.all in the spec, we could actually turn this into variant B. So it sounds much more complicated when we try to talk through it all, but at a really high level, it's pretty much that pseudocode that I was showing you earlier. Um, but because we're able to show that that pseudocode is the only difference, we were able to defer making a decision on A versus B and unblocked any of the objections to either of the semantics. We actually clarified that the feature would only be in the module goal and never in the script goal, which unblocked objections about interoperability. We also deferred all the current behavior for to current behavior for handling deadlock, which unblocked any of the objections related to cycles. And in May of 2018, top level away went to stage two. So to wrap this up, we kind of got to figure out what's next. How do we get from you know, this high level thing that we're at right now to a chipping in the language? And I want to move forward with variant B, and we have to build consensus around those semantics. Um, we're going to have to go through a variety of e examples to define the semantics of deadlock. What do we do when two modules are referencing each other? And we have to specify that and come up with consistent behavior. We also need to get the text finished and reviewed and approved. Um, so as an ETA, we're kind of awaiting for a while here. Um, but I think that you know, as long as people are patient and as long as I'm persistent, uh, I'm pretty sure that it will actually happen. Uh, thank you very much. This is a surfing dog. <laughs>